Hello and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium once again. This session is a class-wide reading intervention that works. My name is Melissa Klug and I am joined by my colleague, Nicole Kopko. We are so excited to facilitate this session for everyone. Before we start, we have just a few housekeeping items to review. You can access the presenter handouts for this session, um, the presenter bio and the conference schedule on the patent website. Nicole's going to put that link in the chat for you as a reminder. Um, also as a reminder, this session will be recorded and it is 75 minutes in length and that includes a 15 minute question and answer period at the end. If you would like to access the closed captioning, click on the CC Live transcript um, on the bottom control. And if you experience technical difficulties, please go to the technical support guide area above the schedule on the symposium page. Because this is a webinar, microphones have been muted and your video feature has been turned off. Uh, we would love for you to tweet out or share on social media what you're learning throughout the Literacy Symposium, and especially this session. The hashtag for the symposium is hashtag patent lit 2022. We can put that in the chat as well. And um, if you have any questions throughout, you can go ahead and use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen there, and we will make sure that those are answered. And right now, we would like to turn it over and introduce you to Lindsay Kimini. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I love the patent organization. And I often joke that I would like to move to Pennsylvania just because of patent. So I'm so excited to be presenting for you guys today and sharing all about a class-wide reading intervention that really does work. So my name is Lindsay Kemeny, as I said, and um, you can see a little bit about me here, but the important thing to know is that I'm a classroom teacher. Uh, I just finished teaching second grade um, and I'm switching to first grade next year. I've also taught kindergarten and I've been a reading intervention teacher for all grades. And um, I have a son with dyslexia. He has severe dyslexia and really he's the reason I'm here today because he was diagnosed four years ago and that's what started me on my journey to effective reading um, instruction. So um, I also have a podcast. So I'm the co-host of the Literacy Talks podcast. So I encourage you to check that out. All right, so today, these are our objectives. So I want everyone to understand the purpose of a class-wide intervention. The bulk of our time is gonna be spent here in the middle where we're gonna be talking about how to implement a specific class-wide intervention. I'm going to give you all the tools that you need so you could implement this tomorrow if you wanted to. And then we're going to, um, I want you to understand how this intervention can fit in that bigger picture of the MTSS framework. All right, so to start, um, I would like to start with a story. Uh, I have four children, and so this story is about my second son, Jack, when he was three years old and um, in swim lessons. And he was taking swim lessons. It was in one of those above ground circular pools in someone's backyard. And so there was like a little corner deck on, on one side where parents could sit and where you could access into the pool, but you couldn't access the other side, or like the deep side of the pool. And um, he was in a class with, uh, he was three years old and he was in the class. There was about uh, 10 three-year-olds in his class, which probably should have been my first warning sign. <laughs> but um, so he, uh, so most of the time they would kind of sit there on the steps and then the teacher would just take them out one by one to practice their swimming strokes. But this particular day, she had them practicing that wall hold. So they were all on the wall holding on and then they were just supposed to do that little crab walk and she had them all do that crab walk over into the deep end and then from there they just had to hang on and from there she took them out one at a time to practice swimming in the deep end so uh my son jack is hanging on and he's kind of at the end of the line so he um so he's having to wait a while before it's his turn with the teacher and i'm watching him and i see him let go and slip under the water. And he, you know, is only three and doesn't have the strength. I could just see the top of his head under the water and he doesn't have that strength to swim and get his head above. So instantly I stand up and I start shouting. 
Jack is under the water. Get Jack, get Jack. He's under the water. And the teacher doesn't hear me. And she's so focused on the one student, uh, her, you know, in this, that she's working with that she's not paying attention to anyone else. And it's loud and the parents are talking and the, the water is loud. So she doesn't hear me. So all the other parents sitting on the deck see that I'm yelling, see what's happening. So then all of them stand up and we all start shouting and yelling, get Jack. Jack is under, under the water. There's a kid under the water. And finally, I mean, it seems like an eternity to me as a parent. Finally, she looks and she sees us, sees where we're pointing and then goes over and gets my son, Jack. And it seemed like forever, but thankfully he hadn't inhaled any water and he was okay. So um, I like to think about that because we can, you know, we can think about like how the teacher could have prevented this from happening. And I want to think about some mistakes that she made and think of how that can serve as an analogy to the classroom. So this teacher was so focused on the one student, right? And she wasn't keeping an eye on the rest of the students. And as teachers, we need to be constantly watching all those students, not just the one we're doing intervention with, but everyone else to make sure that we haven't missed anyone. Is there anyone else who may, may need help? And then um, wouldn't it have been great if this swim teacher had a magic wand and she could have you know, put that wand along over all the kids on those, the wall and, and known who was at risk? Who is at risk for letting go of the wall? Who was at risk for drowning? So what's great is that for the classroom, we do have something like that. And that is a screening assessment. So that is the purpose of a screening assessment. It's to see who needs help, who's at risk for not meeting benchmark by the end of the year, who's at risk, who needs help. And so examples of those would be a cadence that's the screener that I use and I love. Um, there's also Dibbles, there's AimsWeb, all right? But again, so if, think back to our swim teacher. If she uses that magic wand, she knows who's at risk. That still doesn't tell her what that little swimmer needs. Do they struggle with muscle strength? Is it lung capacity? Holding their breath? Is it coordination? Do they need help with a certain stroke? Um, the screener is not going to help with that, with reading. So we need to have another assessment. And that's where our diagnostic assessment comes in, because that's going to tell us exactly what the student needs. What phonic skills are they struggling with? Um, what phonemic awareness skills are they struggling with? So examples of a diagnostic assessment would be like the core phonics survey. If you're taking letters training, then there's a letters, phonics, and word reading survey. There's the past for phonemic awareness. And then we have progress monitoring and the progress monitoring is measuring how is this student responding to my instruction, to the intervention I'm giving, is it working? And then it's also telling you, did I miss anyone? So I'm a nerd because I love assessment and I love using the data I get from this assessment to guide my instruction. And that's the key. Uh, in, and especially the key in a multi-tiered system of supports. And I love the definition here that I have put here where an MTSS is the systematic use of assessment data to most efficiently allocate resources in order to enhance that learning. So uh, if you're not doing anything with the data from your assessments, then you might as well not be doing the assessment. Then there is no point, right? So you need to do something with it. You need to use it. And that's where this comes in. So as you're looking at your data, that's going to tell you who needs help and who needs more help and how everything is going. So we have most of our students should be able to um, reach grade level with our tier one instruction. We need really strong tier one, and that's going to help the majority of our students. But then there's some students that are going to need a little more targeted small group interventions, right? They're going to need tier two instruction in order to reach grade level. And then some students are going to need tier three, even more individualized, even more intensive in order for them to 
um, get to grade level. So, and the important thing is that they're not getting tier two instead of tier one, or they're not getting tier three instead of tier one, but they're getting it in addition to. So the student that is being serviced in tier two is also getting tier one instruction. And same with tier three, they're getting the tier one and the tier two. So they're getting a double or triple dose, and that's what they need in order to get grade level. But what happens if the majority of your students seem to need tier two or tier three? What happens if this triangle is kind of upside down? That's the situation that I was in this, uh, this last past year, where these are our scores at the beginning of the year, um, teaching second grade, I was really alarmed to see that over half of my class was red or yellow. So these are our Acadian scores. Yellow is below benchmark and red is far below benchmark. So you can see these are their fluency scores here on the left and then the accuracy scores on the right. So I was really worried. And you can see that our class median was 50 words correct per minute. And so that is the class median is just your very middle score. If you take all your scores, all your students, it's the score that's in the middle. And the benchmark for the beginning of a year in second grade is 52 words correct per minute with 90% accuracy. So I was alarmed. And I also, if you look at um, these, let me get my pointer out. If you look at, I had some of these students where I thought it almost was like we needed another color for them because I had, you know, two students that were only reading three words correct in a minute. It was like they weren't even quite read yet. And then, you know, a couple that are just 10 and 11. So I was concerned. Um, and then, you know, I still, you got to watch the green kids too. Those are those ones on the wall that might slip and you might not notice. So you, I have to keep an eye on everyone. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a lot. I always progress monitor my red and yellow, the students that are in red or yellow, you know, I progress monitor them weekly or every other week. Wow, how can I do that with 13 students? That's gonna be a lot. And so I, but I knew, hey, I've learned a lot about the science of reading. I just need to really focus and I'm gonna do all my things and I'm gonna start. Um, I don't know how small group is going to go because I like to meet everyone in small group, but I give the ones that are uh, need the most support a little more time. And I wasn't sure how can I do that though when I have like half my class that really needs that extra support. But I'm like, here we go. Let's just do the things that I do. So here is our growth after two weeks um, of just kind of my business as usual, doing my small group intervention like I do every year. And we can see some, some, uh, some good growth. Um, let's see, I wanna see about an increase from one to two words correct per minute every, uh, we, uh, every week. And um, so, okay, I have, you know, the student went from 10 to 12 words. This one went from three to nine, that was great. My other one with three though only went to four. Some good growth here, but look, the student stayed the same. These ones only improved once, the, these ones or one word, these ones only improved one word. So. And then our class median was 51. So it was 50, went to 51, not a huge, not a huge jump. So I'm just thinking, ugh, what do I do? And then I saw this presentation by Dr. Matt Burns last fall. I think it was in September. And he gave this presentation for Patton. And it was like an answer to a prayer because he was talking about class-wide interventions, what to do when the majority of your students are behind and you can't give intervention to, to you know, small group intervention as well. Here's an intervention that you can give to the whole class. And so I highly recommend this. I didn't put the link because it was kind of long, but if you just type into Google, YouTube, Patton, Matt, Matt Burns, you're going to find this exact um, presentation and he's going to share all about his research. It's two hours long, but it is excellent. And he's going to include uh, math interventions as well. So I was excited. I listened to this presentation. I really didn't expect that the very, I'd have something so concrete to implement the very next day, but that is exactly what happened. And I just thought this is exactly what my class needs. And uh, the intervention is two weeks. 
Um, but you can do it longer and I'll talk about that in a minute, but you can do it for only two weeks. And so that's what I did. So here, uh, initially, that's what I did. So here are our scores after, you know, my first two weeks of business as usual, our class meeting was 51. Then I implemented this, um, reading intervention. It's called partner reading paragraph shrinking. And two weeks later, here are our scores. 64 words correct per minute. We went from 51 for a class median to 64, which was huge. And so I was so excited. And look, even like my most struggling student here, he started at three, then he's at four. He increased to eight. I was so excited with this. Now you could stop, I could have stopped here, but I kind of, I continue to do this throughout the year, um, sometimes not as intense and not every day. So if you wanna look at those, the growth again, here's the words correct per minute of you know my, my most struggling students here. You can see where they started and two weeks later where they ended. So I thought that was uh, great. And then you can see, oh, and our class median 64. And then you can kind of compare the first two weeks when I did this um, without the partner reading paragraph shrinking, and then this the second two weeks, you can kind of see the difference in their growth. And the majority of them had a lot more growth after I implemented this partner reading strategy. Um, you can compare the, their first increase, the blue is their first increase. Um, the red is the second increase once I did it with partner reading paragraph shrinking. So there's a couple that saw more growth um, the first two weeks, but they had grown so much that they still had a lot of good growth uh, the second two weeks. So here we go. I am going to share with you all about this strategy so that you can do it in your classroom. Um, it's called Partner Reading Paragraph Shrinking. And if you've heard of PALS, peer assisted learning strategy. It's like a pared down shorter version of PALS. And it is recommended for grades two through eight. So second through eighth. And I, I was worried at first because my second graders were so behind. It was, I felt like a lot of them were first graders. So I was worried at first that this um, intervention wouldn't work for my students, but you can still see it still did. And I, ha I had to make a, a few adjustments, which I'll share. Um, and, and because of that, also, I will add, as I said, I'm being moved to first grade next year. And I think I'll still be able to do this, you know, maybe the second half of the year with a few um, changes. It only takes 20 minutes a day. And it's evidence based. Um, the PALS is developed by researchers, and there's a ton of research to support it. So if you're a research buff, then snap a screenshot, or if your administrators need to have research for what you're doing in your classroom, you could snap a, a, a picture of this because I'm going to, these three studies are specifically on this specific pared down version, um, the partner reading paragraph shrinking. And they also saw positive results in science comprehension with one of these um, in, in older learners. So you can uh, see that. And then this, these research studies here are just research, research that supports PALS. And like I said, the one we're doing is kind of a pared down version of PALS. So you can see those. All right. So here's what you need to do. The first thing you need to do is find out if there's a class-wide need in your class. So how you're going to do that is you're going to find the class median. That's just that middle score. Um, I just will Google median calculator, and then I'll just copy and paste all our scores. I'll take our reading fluency scores, and I just copy and paste them in there, and it will tell me my the median so I don't have to like put them in order and figure it out. Then if the median is below the criterion, you have a class-wide need. So that's what I saw at the beginning of the year. My second graders, the median was 50, but the benchmark was 52 words correct per minute. So our median was below the criterion. That tells me, yes, I have a class-wide need. Now, Dr. Burns talks about a backup rule. And he says, if your median's okay, but you still have over seven kids that are below that benchmark, then it's still beneficial to do it, this class-wide intervention. 
So this is a partner reading intervention. So you need to create partners and how you do that is you're going to take your scores and you're going to list them in order from least fluent to most fluent. And then you're going to divide the class in half. And then you're going to pair, um, you know, the, the weakest reader in this half with the weakest reader in this half, then the next one with this one, you know, so you would not want to put your strongest reader with the most struggling reader that is just going to be frustrating for everybody. Um, so, and, and you don't want just two readers about the same level either, because we want a stronger reader in each partnership. All right. Now I have seen some teachers that when they do this, they might take the most struggling students and not assign them partner and work with them for an intervention at this time, instead of giving a partnership with them. So you can see, I could have done that where I had um, some that were so low. I opted not to do that. The reason why was because I am already providing intervention for them at another time in my block. And so I knew they're already getting intervention with me. And so I really wanted them to have this practice opportunity and to be in the partners. And I wanted to be available to help all my, um, all my students and to mo be monitoring, especially that first two weeks when it was a brand new thing that everyone was learning. Uh, but at the end of the year where this gap kind of widened and I really only had um, this one student, um, he has severe dyslexia. So he, um, I would sometimes partner him. He did great. Other times I would just partner self, partner myself with him. And this was at the end of the year, um, just to give him that extra attention and support. All right. So let's get into what this entails. As I said, it just takes 20 minutes. Definitely take a picture of this. Um, and this is the procedure. So you're gonna have the stronger reader and a weaker reader in each pair, but the students don't know who's the stronger and who's the, the weaker, okay? So you're just gonna call them like reader one, reader two. I do milk and cookies. So one partner is the milk, that's my stronger reader. And then the cookie is the weaker reader, okay? And so um, the first thing is that stronger reader is gonna read aloud for five minutes. And I'll talk about the passages in a minute. So they're gonna read aloud for five minutes. Next, the weaker reader is going to start at the beginning, the same place the stronger reader re did and read the same text for five minutes. Then it's back to the stronger reader's turn. And now they're gonna read again for five minutes. They're gonna continue wherever the weaker reader left off, you know, for this number three, they're gonna continue. And then they're gonna stop and they're gonna summarize after every paragraph. And I'm going to tell you how exactly how to teach them to summarize in a minute. And then for the last five minutes, now it's the weakers, weaker readers turn, and they're going to continue the text wherever the other partner left off and they're going to stop and they're going to summarize after every paragraph. So I am leading this. So I just put my phone up in the front of the room with a timer, a five minute timer. And I say, okay, we're starting milks. It's your turn to read. Um, milks are going to read. And my Cookies are following along and I make sure that the non-reading partner, they have to follow along with their finger. Okay, so I start the timer. And then when my timer goes off, I go back up and I say, okay, cookies, it's your turn. Go back to the beginning and it's cookies turn to read. I start my timer. When the timer goes off, I say, okay, milks, it's back to you. Now you're gonna do paragraph shrinking and you're gonna start wherever the cookies left off. Set my timer. It goes off and then um, I'll say, okay, cookies, it's your turn. You're gonna keep reading wherever milk's left off. And now you are going to um, paragraph shrink is what we call it and start my timer. Okay, so I'm walking them through it. You could also, if you're pressed for time, you could put each of these for four minutes instead of five minutes, then the whole intervention is only going to take 16 minutes. So this really doesn't have to take up a lot of your day because I know as teachers, we have a million things to be doing, right? So let me just show you a little, um, it's like a one minute video clip of my students partner reading in the classroom. So you can kind of get a feel of what this looks like. Oops, let's see. Uh, 
down and let me fill up. Sorry, did that stop? A little Okay, so I created this handout. This was really helpful for, for me, especially at the beginning to help me remember kind of the steps and when they're reading the same text and then when they're going on to read um, another text. So this is um, available in the handouts for you and um, you are welcome to download that, print it off and use it in your classroom. Um, obviously don't download it and then sell it. I right? don't be that person, um, but you're welcome to use it. And then um, my sister uses, uh, my, my sister teaches fourth grade and she's like, um, that she uses chips and salsa. So she says, oh, so I thought that is so cute. So instead of milk and cookie, she calls it the chips and salsa. So I made one like that too. And then I made just a generic one for, that just says partner one and partner two, if you don't wanna use the names. Initially, I was thinking, um, I was thinking like, Oh, maybe those upper grades, if you're seventh or eighth grade teacher, maybe you don't want to use like milk and cookies or chips and salsa. But then I was thinking about it and I'm like, you know what, whatever. I bet some of those eighth graders would be down with that. <laughs> they would think it's fun. All right. So I did see a comment about passages. Don't worry. I'm going to get there and I'm going to talk about that. Um, all right. So uh, paragraph shrinking. This is the, what, the steps they use to do that summarizing. All right. So uh, the first thing they do is they're going to name the most important who or what. So they read that paragraph and then you say, what's the most important who or what in that sentence? Then they're going to tell the most important thing about the who or what. And then they're going to say that main idea in 10 words or less. So um, let me show you um, a student in my class doing this paragraph shrinking. Okay, tell us what the most important who or what is in that from that paragraph. Okay, the turtles. The turtles. Okay, and what's the most important thing about the turtles in that paragraph? Um, it, it, that a predator not that the predator the predator cannot bite the hard shell. Okay, cool. Can you say it in ten words or less? A predator cannot bite the hard shell of a turtle. Ooh, perfect. Okay, keep going. Shells come in many different. This is such a good strategy, that paragraph shrinking, where they are um, trying to, you know, say that main idea in 10 words or less really helps them focus on, you know, what is this, what are we learning or from this paragraph or what is the, what is it saying? Um, and then what I do is I have the little cards that the students use. So whoever's turn it is, so I have the main partner whose turn it is to be summarizing, the other partner is going to ask them the questions and that gives them a, a way to kind of be involved, to stay on task and to pay attention. So here's um, a little video clip of two girls in my classroom that are doing this. And I'm sorry for the background noise. Everyone is paragraph shrinking right now, but hopefully you can still hear them. Okay, go ahead. The most important who or what is at foot. It's about the baby panda. Okay. The most
most important thing about Cthulhu, what is that they, um, it doesn't look like it at first, but it does at, uh, when it goes on. Um, okay. Okay, so Hazel, I didn't understand that. What was the most thing about the baby, the most important thing about the baby panda in the paragraph you read? What was it saying about the baby panda? It, at first, it doesn't look like it's mine. Oh, at first, it doesn't look like the baby. Okay, I see. All right, keep going. Okay, since the main idea and ten words or less, what's the baby panda grows up? At first, it doesn't look like. Ah, almost, try again. Baby pandas don't look like their mothers at first. Perfect, you got it. Okay, keep going. Oh, it's Maylee's turn, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this paragraph shrinking requires a lot of modeling and a lot of revisiting. Um, and so I will do that. I will model it a lot. I'll model it at other times of the day, just when we're reading like our normal and kind of our normal comprehension um, and vocabulary lesson. I'm going to model how to paragraph shrink in all different kinds of texts and have the students practice this as well. And um, so I made these cards. So I created these paragraph shrinking and these cards are available in our handouts. So you are welcome to download and use this in your classroom as well. So that is paragraph shrinking. And then I put these in their folders. So you can see the little girl in my class was holding it to know what to say uh, by the end of the year. I mean, they really had it memorized. They didn't, <laughs> didn't need the steps anymore. All right, so let's talk about the passages. So I know we've had a lot of questions about that. So um, the passages need to be on the weaker reader's reading level. And so um, I have students that are um, all on kind of different different levels in my in my classroom. So some are okay with a second rate grade level and some are not. And I'm gonna talk about the ones that are, are um, far behind and need a lot of support in just a minute. Um, now, Dr. Burns, when he described this and in their research, they had them just read the passage one time. So once each um, partner had read the passage one time, they would put it in the back of their folder and go to the new one and they wouldn't ever read that one again. So for me, I did this a little differently. I had them reread passages because I know that research supports repeated readings. And also for me, it was just not feasible to print off new passages every day. And so I had a set of, um, so I would give them like a set of six to eight passages that they would read throughout the week. And then I would um, switch passages the next week. Sometimes I would switch like every fourth day uh, and, um, uh, and, but th so it worked out where I was really only having to print and assemble these, uh, every week. Um, and so the sets that I would use, I'm going to talk about those in, in just a minute. Um, the, I, they're themed sets. So like it's, I staple them together. That's the other thing I should say <laughs> for my second graders. I knew we couldn't have these loose passages because they would waste so much time trying to find like the right, have them both have the same passage. And so I'm like, that's going to be a mess. So I'm going to staple them like a book so that it's all there and we're not going to waste any time trying to find the right passage. Okay. But anyways, they're, they're themed. So I have, you know, they're all like, all the passages that week are on weather, or they're all on sports, or they're all on volcanoes, all on living things. And that was so awesome because it was so great for their vocabulary development and for their background knowledge. So let me show you where I would get these passages. Uh, there we go. I would use ReadWorks. ReadWorks is an awesome website, readworks.org, and it is free. And you just need to sign up and have a login, but it's free. And there are so many 
reading passages and content on here. So I'm going to show you, I just made a little screen cast video, like a screen recording of where I would find my passages uh, for this, um, because there's a lot of info on their, on their website. So let me show you that. Okay, here is how I find my passages on ReadWorks. So you just go to readworks.org and then you need to create an account uh, or log in if you already have one. And so it is free. And then you just scroll down until you find the article a day scope and sequence. Looks like this right here. So I just click on that and then it's going to show me all the topics and they're organized by month. And so let's pretend like it's a September. So I'm just going to click September and it's going to show me all grades K through eight and the topics are the same between them. And then uh, there'll be some overlap with the passages, but sometimes, but the passages, um, you know, the, obviously they're going to be, they differ in difficulty level. So I could come right here to second grade and let's say it's week three and we're doing weather. And so my students that are ready and can read a second grade level, this is what I would choose for them. So I would click there and it's going to show me all the different passages. I can click here to look at the different ones. Over here, it will tell me the range of Lexile levels. And it, there's also some challenge articles if you want to include. So you just click print and you can do some of the articles or all of them. And then you can choose whether to include the challenge articles and click print and it will make them into a PDF that you can uh, send to your printer. Now let's go back. I just want to show you it's not perfect. So if I have students in, at the beginning of the year, second grade, and let's say they're a couple years behind and they're more on a kindergarten level. Well, look, when I click on the kindergarten uh, passages, I mean, to me, that is not a kindergarten level, especially beginning of the kinder beginning of the year kindergarten. So if I have a student that's a couple years behind, if I gave them this, they're just going to guess their way through it and, um, and just learn some bad habits. So for those students, I would choose a decodable passage somewhere else. And that's how I use ReadWorks. Okay. So as I said, it wasn't perfect. So I could kind of see, okay, uh, you know, some can be a second grade level, some can be on that first grade level in ReadWorks. Um, but if they weren't, if they weren't really on a second grade level, what I found is I had to use decodable text a lot because I absolutely do not want them building bad habits and just guessing. And you could see like, especially with my students, like think back to those beginning of the year scores. I have, you know, students only reading three words correct per minute. There's no way I would give them a normal um, uh, passage that was not decodable, you know, and a lot of those, a lot of my other students as well, if they were behind in second grade, I found I really need to give them decodable texts that were, um, that was more aligned with what they were learning in our phonics lessons and our phonics interventions. So that is what I did for a lot of my students. So my school has the Spire program and, um, and so I have access to all of the online Spire passages. And so I would just choose those. And I would kind of like, if some of my students I know, like they're working on short A, then I'm for, for that student and his partner, I'm printing off those short A passages that he's going to practice and I'm going to staple them just like you see here. Um, then I also have decodable texts that match the phonics program that we're using. So they, um, they are using that. And then um, down here, I have, um, I just, I've spent a lot of time collecting high quality decodable texts, especially since, you know, I was teaching kindergarten. And um, so I've written grants and used donors choose and lots of different things to collect decodable texts. So um, I would use that in my classroom. And this is also why I think I could do this partner reading paragraph shrinking in first grade, because it wouldn't be an intervention necess necessarily, but just a great practice opportunity. And um, 
and I could use decodable text to do that aligned with what we're learning. And so I, th I was thinking, you know, maybe the second half of first grade, I'll be able to, to do that. So um, this is great. Of course, these students, their, their, their main focus isn't on fluency, but it is on automaticity, right? We're working on that all the time. And I want them to have multiple exposures to a lot of the words and to the, a lot of the phonics concepts that they're learning. And so this is a great practice opportunity. And then I would watch them and throughout the year, I could transition them. And I have like, you know, these are very highly decodable. Then I could transition them to these, or I could use them both the same. And then I could transition them to some texts that are maybe, they're still decodable, but the percentage of decodability was a little less. And I liked that because I think it served as a great like transition into regular texts. And then I would transition them into, you know, maybe either the kindergarten or first grade read works, and then I could transition them up. So anyways, I thought um, it was great. I thought the decodables worked great for a lot of those students. Uh, this is that same video, but so I'll just show it like 20 seconds of it. So just look and you can see how they have different passages. These guys have little the little books. And these ones have a different set of books. And again, it's on, um, and the, these guys have a read works passage. So again, it's on the weaker readers reading level. All right. So um, then it's really important that the students kind of learn how to be a coach because the non-reading partner is the coach and both students are going to have the opportunity to, to be a, a coach. So you saw that, you know, I had them following along with their finger and I tell them, you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready to help your partner if they need help with the word. And so it's important to explicitly teach them an error correction procedure so that they know what to do when um, their partner misses a word or can't figure out a word. So I created this sheet, ask then tell, and this um, procedure comes straight from Dr. Anita Archer in her book, Explicit Instruction. She explains this, and then I just made the little handout, and I put that in the handouts as well so that you can print this off and have it in your classroom. And then last summer, I created a YouTube video um, that I could show to my students that would just um, teach them how to use this and do the ask then tell strategy. So I'm gonna show that video to you. What happens if your partner misses a word? Well, then we have a strategy called ask then tell. And you can have one of these cards at your desk that will help you remember what to do. So if you hear your partner say a wrong word, you're going to point to the word they missed and say, can you figure out this word? Then you're gonna wait four seconds. You can just count in your head. And then you're going to tell them the word. This word is, and you tell them, what word? And you have them tell the word back to you. Then you say, now reread the sentence. And you have them read a, the sentence again. Let's watch some students practice this strategy. You're going to listen carefully. And the first thing you do when you hear your partner say a wrong word is ask, can you figure out this word? Bears are caught with fur. Can you figure out this word? Then you'll just count in your mind, one, two, three, four. If your partner gets the word, great. If not, you're gonna tell them the word, ask them to say it back, and then have them reread the sentence. Let's watch. This so, word is covered. What word? Covered. Now reread the sentence. Bears are covered with fur. Maybe your partner is just stuck on a word and hasn't read it yet. Well, if they're stuck, just do the second part of the card. So just count one, two, three, four. If they haven't figured out the word, then you can tell them. This word is, tell them the word. What word? They tell it back to you. Now reread the sentence. You can use this ask then tell strategy anytime you partner read. Okay, so that's on my YouTube channel. So if my YouTube channel is just my name, Lindsay Kemeny, um, it's uh, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y and K-E-M-E-N-Y. You can see that on my last slide, you'll see my name there too. Um, so if you just search, you can find that. And I don't have a ton of videos on there. I'm not like a huge YouTuber, so it will be easy for you to find. Um, and that was great. You can show that in your 
in, in your classroom. So it was fun making that video. Those were two of my own kids that I just did last summer. And they were both like fighting over who would get to be the one who would mess up, you know? <laughs> so it was kind of fun. All right. And then, um, so I wanted, so a lot of times when I am reading um, with, when students are reading to me, a lot of times I don't even have to correct them. I just kind of point to the word that they need to, um, they need to reread. And um, so I just thought this was so cute that I caught this little boy in my class doing something similar and just like, look at what a good coach he is because he is just intently following along and then he's ready and he's like going to point, you know, on her paper and he just kind of has her point and she rereads it and they keep going. And I thought it was so cute. So here's this. So I thought that was so cute. So they really, they have to practice and we talk about um, how to be a good, a good coach. All right. So for setup, so you'll just need like a folder or a bag for each pair. And inside the folder, you're going to include that air correction procedure. That's that ask then tell, and that's in your handouts. And then also the paragraph shrinking, both of those, and you can see them here in this picture, both of those are so important because they really rely on those. The students will really read those. Um, as they're working. And then of course you need the passages. So you can see that this one, I actually had like a couple books in each one. And then once they finished the books, um, they went to the, this is the Dakota Bowl, the Spire passages. So they went to those after. Um, so you'll need the passages in there. And then um, you could put the rules in there too. And I'll show you the rules on the next slide. Um, I opted not to put the rules in their folders and I would just post it up on the whiteboard when we we're doing this time. And then what you need to do is you need to practice those setup procedures. So think through how they're gonna do that. Are you gonna keep the folders in one part of the room and then they're gonna walk over there and get them and then where do they go? Do you want them sitting at the floor? Do you want them sitting at their desks? Um, so you wanna think through all that. For mine, you can kind of see my students were sitting in pairs. So initially, I would, um, I just, they have assigned seats and I assigned them with their partner reading partner so that they're right there. Um, then what happened is that I started wanting to change our partner reading partners faster than I wanted to change like our whole um, uh, like assigned seats because you guys know it's like crafting a puzzle sometimes figuring out where they're going to sit, where it's most effective for students. So then sometimes I would just have them, then they just kind of knew where they switched. And I say, okay, we're doing partner reading. And the ones that needed to change seats would just quickly change seats. And then how I did it is that we did this right after recess. So it really worked out where I could set their folders out already on the desks. And then when they came in, they just knew exactly where to go. So that's one thing to think about is that setup. Um, I would probably laminate my folders next year because this year the um, folders really, I have thrown them all away. They're all ripped and I had taped them together. And especially the ones that had um, text like decodable books in theirs, then the folders would get kind of thrashed. All right. So um, you definitely want to um, have some rules and you wanna introduce these rules and then you need to revisit them every so often. If you have students starting to get a little off task, then I'd have to like pull them back together and let's review what our rules are. And especially like after winter break or after spring break, then we'd have to revisit our partner reading paragraph shrinking rules. So okay. those, um, rules are here. And again, I just created this and I put it in the handouts for you. So I hope that's useful. Um, these are our rules. They can talk only to your partner and only about your reading. Um, keep the voices low, cooperate with your partner, try your best, and then um, follow directions, of course. So we would talk and kind of review and talk about that. 
All right, let's talk about timeline. So this comes right from Dr. Burns. Snap a picture of this so that you know um, how to set this up. So initially you're gonna collect your data and you're gonna do your pretest. This is why it's great to do it right after you already did your benchmark screening if you're required to do that um, so that you have it because you're gonna to wanna to see the growth because that's the fun part. And then day one, you're gonna train students on the setup procedures and then you're gonna train them on that ask then tell, that error correction strategy. So you can show that video. And then you're going to practice reading just the first half. So you're only gonna take 10 minutes. The stronger reader will read for five minutes. Then the weaker reader is going to read for five minutes. Okay, and then you're done. Day two, now you're gonna train them on the paragraph shrinking. You're gonna model that for them. And then you're going to five minutes, the stronger reader reads and does paragraph shrinking. And then five minutes, the weaker reader does. And then 10 minutes and you're done. And then days three through 10, you're gonna do it the whole routine um, as written for either 16 to 20 minutes. Okay, so that's just two weeks and then you could be done and you could do your post-test and you can be done. Um, or you can decide to continue throughout the year. My students liked it. I saw so much growth that I really continued to do it throughout the year, um, not all the time, like maybe three times a week. Um, and sometimes I would, and I, I even went through some where I wasn't doing it. And then I saw like our progress monitoring wasn't as good. So um, I liked kind of keeping it up throughout the year. And then every once in a while we would do, okay, we're doing the next couple of weeks every day. So it's a, it's a great strategy for the classroom. All right. And then there was a question about changing partners. Um, you really just want to watch this. So I would change partners maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, kind of depending on how often we were doing it and how the partnership was working. And it's something I would just really watch the data and I would switch someone if it wasn't working for them. And so I have an example of that here. So I want you to see this student K where she was do doing really good. Um, that first, that, that first big jump she made. So initially she's kind of about in the middle of my class. So initially she was the weaker reader reading with a stronger uh, reader. And then um, you can see here, wow, she did this jump. So she was 70 words correct per minute. And so, so now she's kind of in the upper half. And so right here, I switched her partners and I made her the stronger reader and working with um, a weaker reader. Okay. And then look what happens at, after the next two weeks, she dropped, she dropped down. So I was like, wow, that, um, that, that partnership did not, wasn't working for her. She wasn't ready to be the stronger reader. It also wasn't benefiting her to be reading the very basic decodable that this little guy was. And so I really had to be watch, especially whoever I paired with some of my weaker ones. I wanted to make sure that it was benefiting both of them. And so with her, I just thought, okay, she, she's not ready to be the stronger reader and she still needs support. So I changed her, made her the weaker reader reading with someone stronger, and then look at her scores the next, after the next two weeks. So they went back up. So, um, I was like, okay, that's good. And I, and I found with her, that's what I needed to do. She needed to be the weaker reader. She needed to have that good model. And, um, and, uh, and then if you want to see, and then, you know, towards the end of the year though, uh, or the second half of the year, she was a lot stronger Then I could have her be the stronger reader and it, and it was fine. Um, so if you want to see by the end of the year, um, she, had 121 words correct per minute. So um, that is awesome. So she just made huge growth. And you can kind of see my, my class median here in October went up to 70. In November, the class median was 83. And I'm going to share with you in a minute um, what, the, what it was at the end of the year. Um, and then, you know, you might be worried as worried at first for my strongest readers and, you know, I, because I didn't want it to be a waste of time for them. And the great thing is that I really didn't feel like it was, you know, Dr. Burns in his presentation talks a lot about, Hey, we need strong readers. It's just 16 to 20 minutes. And really I found that the strong readers, um, 
really their fluency increased as well. Um, even though maybe the passage was, was a little easy for them, it was still really helpful for them to do the paragraph shrinking and to have the fluency practice. So you can see this is kind of my most fluent student who comes in at the beginning of the year at 164 words correct per minute. And, um, and just at the end of the year, um, I don't have it here, but at the end of the year, he was reading 205 words correct per minute. And it wasn't speed reading because that would be a concern. And I had another student that was just trying to read fast and then his comprehension would suffer and I had to slow him down. But this student, it wasn't. He had like, just like you and I would read. I mean, he really was gifted and he had um, uh, great prosody and he could retell and he could um, paragraph shrink. Awesome. And so even though, I mean, the focus, I like that the focus of this intervention isn't just like timing them for a minute. How far did you get? What did you do? You're trying to beat it. That really wasn't the focus. It was just reading and just reading practice. And they wanted to sound fluent and they needed to in order to um, be able to paragraph shrink. So I just, I just uh, love this and didn't feel like it was a waste of time for anybody in the classroom. Um, I did want to address just one quick question that I saw was um, like, what do they do if they end a paragraph and they paragraph shrink and the five minutes is still going? They just keep going. So they just, they read one paragraph and they paragraph shrink. They read the next paragraph, paragraph shrink. They keep reading those passages. That's why I have six to eight. They're not all going to get to the end. And then, um, and then if they do, if they do get to the end, then they just go bloop, to the beginning of the passage again, if the five minutes isn't over and start again. All right. So, um, and yeah, I use a cadence to progress monitor. Um, all right, so here's our final scores. So a class median at the beginning of the year, benchmark in second grade is 52, we were 50. But by January, the middle of the year, our benchmark is 72 and my students were at 90. The class median was 90 words correct per minute. And you can look over here at the end of the year, um, our benchmark is 87 words correct per minute. And so already at the middle of the year, uh, half of my class is at the end of your benchmark. And then like drum roll, please, if you want to see how my students did at the very end of the year, remember benchmark is 87. Our class median was 118 words correct per minute. So at the beginning of the year, over half the class was below benchmark. At the end of the year, over half the class was above. Uh, okay. All right. But there's some cautions. Um, and so here are my cautions. It's this does not replace your phonics and your whole group reading instruction. Um, this is an opportunity for practice. You can see that I'm not explicitly teaching during this um, intervention, so they still need to be explicitly taught. And especially a lot of those students that are struggling, they're going to need phonics intervention as well. But what this is going to do is it's really going to weed out who, um, because it's going to shrink you, that those students that need tier two and tier three. So I'm doing this whole group and then I can kind of weed out, okay, who do I need to spend a lot of that intervention time with? And, um, you know, of course, second grade, everyone really still needs phonics instruction and our whole group. And so this doesn't replace that. Okay. So you've got to find a place to fit this in your schedule, but not take out those elements. And then it's not a tier two intervention. This is a class-wide intervention. So yes, there's still going to be students who need help and they might not need a fluency intervention, right? They can still do this intervention to have opportunities to practice and to have that repetition, but they, um, they're they still going to need, you're going to need to see exactly what they need, what phonics concepts they need, what phonemic awareness intervention you might need to do. All right. So those are just some cautions. So uh, that is my presentation. So I think we're right at the hour mark. So if there are questions, oh, and then I'm on Twitter. So that's probably the best place to follow me because I'm active on there. I love Twitter and I joke that I need like a college degree from everything I've learned <laughs> from Twitter. And then I have my Literacy Talks podcast link there, but you can find that on any um, like, Spotify, Apple, you know, all the podcast platforms. And then I have a blog 
too. And so you can um, see my blog right there, the learning spark.blogspot.com. So, all right, Melissa, do we have some questions? Yeah, thank you. You did a really nice job kind of answering some of those questions as they, as you went along. So um, okay. I appreciate that. Also, there were a few more and I hope that you're seeing in the chat, all of the thank yous um, and people mm -hmm. that really enjoyed your presentation.